consisted of the privilege of reading you a portion of Luke chapter 12, we'll be reading verses 1 through 20, which you can find on page 1014, as well as John 3:16. This is on page 1052 in our Pew Bibles. And I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went through the register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them at the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them, and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was laying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. God, oh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that ever who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And God bless the reading of his word to your soul. May you see him. Verses of two portions of scripture, Luke and um, John 3 16. And they both, it's going to take this off. They both speak about um, the same thing the birth of Jesus um, in Luke, and then in John, uh, God sending the Son there, uh, providing the gift of eternal life. So we're continuing. Looking at the celebrating the glory of God with us, we saw how Mary saw the greatness of God, exalts the Lord, that was last week. Today the title, God with us, have you received life's greatest gift? 
Lord Jesus, we just thank you that we can join together today in celebration of uh, life's greatest gift. And we know very well here, we don't just celebrate it, the Lord, on this time of season, this time of year, but the reality of his birth, the reality of his presence, uh, affecting us on a daily basis, Lord, that's uh, why we are called the Church of New Life, celebrating that new life that we have in Christ. So help us, Lord, to see anew, see afresh uh, the gift of eternal life that has been given to us and how so profoundly it should affect us uh, on a daily basis. For anyone here or anyone watching uh, later that doesn't know for certain they've received that gift of eternal life, well, we pray that they would uh, repent You'd open their eyes, they would see their need for you, and they would turn to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm we're going to concentrate on John 3, 16. Look at some other verses as well. But in providing the gift of eternal life, first we're going to see the magnitude of God's love. First part of verse 16. For God has so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That's the magnitude of his love. I mean, yeah, that's the magnitude of his love right there. Um, let's start there. God so loved the world. The word um, for God, the words for God, indicate this was something that God had done, that God was the initiator of the activity here. And what did God do? We see the magnitude of his love for God so loved the world. That speaks of the intensity of that love. That speaks of the greatness of God's love, God's agape love, God's selfless, sacrificial love. God so loved the world. I remember being at many, 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 many Christmas services uh, in my um, childhood young adult life and um, never never knowing, never really understanding the gift of eternal life. Um, and it didn't matter what church I was in, I was in a particular denomination and I remember we would go there, you know, I, I went weekly for the most part, but um, and celebrating the, the birth of the Savior there and then I remember one year my dad and my dad had decided to take me to his church in Stratford, which was a, a Protestant denomination, and we went to the midnight mass, I think it was. And um, I tell you, they <laughs> both of those traditions really know how to celebrate Christmas. From a, um, I mean, I don't know. I just remember many candles and many poinsettias and many flowers and. Many, just much went into it. And it wasn't just one service, by the way. It would be, you know, four or five. And I think, depending on the tradition, I think the other church that I was part of in early, and I guess maybe we didn't go on Christmas Day, too, but um, some, you know, some, there's multiple services, right? If you just have this one and, and tonight. And, um, but never understand the magnitude of God's love in all those, all those places that I went. The intensity of his love, the greatness of his love is spoken there. For God so loved the world. And the point is not actually that God saves the whole world. But that, that would be universalism. And scripture doesn't teach that everyone will be saved. And, and sadly, many people just think because they believe intellectually that there is a God. Or believe intellectually that Jesus is the Savior, or believe intellectually that he's the Lamb of God, that's still not saving faith. So many people, t so you're, most of us here have an advantage in that <coughs> we're celebrating um, life's greatest gift, knowing him and having a relationship with him. And I always say that knowing him like that and having experienced the gift of eternal life and knowing Christ right, ought to affect us in a more profound way and even more than 
the churches that are packed today in tonight and some tomorrow where they're worshiping but they don't know Jesus in a saving way. We who know him in a saving way uh, are more robust, ought to be more robust and more intense in our worship of him, not just tonight or today or tonight, but all the time. We saw last week how the thing that affected Mary was she saw the greatness of God. And I'll say again that maybe one of the biggest struggles that we have or the evangelical church has is not seeing the greatness of God that it so affects us in a great and glorious way. We let the world, the flesh, the devil sometimes affect us more than we allow Christ to affect us. And the more we see his greatness, and the more we see the magnitude of his love in saving us, it will have a greater effect on our lives. So, for God so loved the world, not meaning that everyone was saved. I was sharing with a family member, uh, boy, this past week, and um, explaining the, 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 the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. And this person was giving definite intellectual consent to it. And I'm like, uh, uh, so you're sure? You're sure that you've made peace with God? And I felt it was important for him to make peace with God right now. And he's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And we talked about it and we prayed. And then we talked about it and prayed the next day. And... and um, Sadly, now, a week later, there's no biblical evidence that this man is, was saved just by how he's conducting himself right now. Family member, loved one. And so now I'm saying, have you really understood that grace and the gift of God, of eternal life that's been given to you? Has that really affected your life and your heart, how could you be saying this? And th th just the different things that are, you know, how he's conducting himself right now. And uh, I'm going to keep doing that because we didn't get too far with that last night at all. But the point is, just like, when someone is, and you could, you could add to that the many, many people that say the prayer, we've covered this so many times here, or we're baptized, or baptized by immersion, and, and we're pronounced saved, and um, as I said, there's no biblical evidence for some that they have been saved. There's no life-changing effect. And this would be like, like a more even immediate life-changing effect if this person just recently came to the Lord. It would be like, you know, but like, you know, 24 hours later, 48 hours later, whatever, it's like, you see the absolute depravity and the sin that rules this person. So the magnitude of God's love has to have, uh, will have a, uh, a life-changing effect. Not that we're perfect, but we're being perfected. And when pointed out, like we as believers in Christ, when someone points out our sin, because we sin, <coughs> we're, you know, broken by it. And confess and repent and just continually move on toward Christ, toward the cross. So this magnitude of God's love here, again, means anyone, Jesus is the only means by which anyone can be saved, all are called to turn to him in repentance, forgiveness of sin, and to have eternal life. All are urged to embrace Christ as Savior and Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the manner of God's love. The magnitude is he so loved the world. Only means by which anyone may be saved. The manner of it is seen here. God so loved the world. The manner is that he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. That's the means by which we're saved. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love for us, toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God's love was expressed in the giving of the gift of his son. 
And so there in John 3, 16, the manner of his love, and there is the invitation, that whosoever believes in him. And so we have to define what that word believes there means. I could say, I, for as long as I can remember, I believed. Probably when I had my first Holy Communion, I could say, I believed. Believed he was the Son of God, believed he was the Savior, <laughs> believed he was born of a virgin, uh, believed he was resurrected from the grave, even believed he was really the only way to salvation. But that's not biblical. That's one part of biblical belief, but it's not, it's not biblical saving belief in Jesus Christ. So you know, and so just, just think about this though, please. Think about the fact that if you really do, we, you really do know the Lord, how you've been saved through Christ, why you've been saved for his own glory. And just that ought to help us to well up with just greater and greater appreciation and motivation for how we live. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Not only the intellectual facts about Jesus. Because if I asked everybody in this room right now, do you believe in Jesus? I believe every single person would raise their hand. And maybe people watching this would be like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Of course I believe in Jesus. Hear the rest of what it means to believe in Jesus from the Word of God. Biblical belief in Jesus refers to reliance upon, not just mere credence to, but reliance upon Christ and Christ alone for salvation and forgiveness of sin. Believing includes agreeing in the mind with the truth about Christ, all those things that we said, he's the son of God, born of a virgin. I mean, I've had people say to me he wasn't born of a virgin, and so they're okay. They don't even have the most basic form of belief that he died on the cross. We would all agree, probably here, that, that, all, that he did all those things. But biblical belief in Jesus is a placing one's confidence and trust in Jesus for salvation and forgiveness of one's own personal sin. And even that person that I just gave that illustration with uh, about a couple, from this past couple of weeks, they gave intellectual assent of believing in Jesus, and they even gave, yeah, I know he died for my sins, believe. That man said, I'm afraid to stand before God in judgment. I said, you should be afraid to stand before God in judgment. Because if any of us stand before God in judgment, the judgments will be condemnation will be eternal death apart from Christ and Christ alone. And this person gave assent, gave, gave that form of belief, which many people will, will take that even second step. There's probably people here in this room who have, or watching later, who have taken even that second step. Yeah, I believe he died for my sins. You know what, um, it's no different than what James 2.19 says. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So whosoever, what do these words mean? Whosoever believes in him. That's a personal invitation to receive the gift of eternal life. God's greatest gift that he gives. The gift of eternal life. Are you among the whosoever this morning who believes in Jesus? Biblical belief placing personal trust in Christ in Christ alone for salvation and forgiveness of my sins. And then that biblical belief in Jesus, this is the part where um, we look and we're like, what happened to that guy? They gave biblical assent that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he was the Savior of the world. What happened to them? They said that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. They said a prayer. They were baptized by immersion. They, they did all that stuff. And now it's like there's no biblical ev In fact, it's like they're like over here living like in the world. There's like no biblical ascent. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no biblical um, evidence that they are the Lord's. And so please, I've said this a million times, don't keep giving that person the assurance of salvation. I mean, that's... Do like we've said before. 
you know, say, you know, that's great, but right now, what, what's going on now? There's no biblical evidence that you are saved. Here's, and you can point out, you're this area or that area, whatever it is. There's no biblical evidence. Are you really the Lord's? I told you the illustration of a pastor who said that to some lady who had kept being told, yes, you're saved, don't worry, and don't ever doubt your salvation, and don't ever question it. And when the Bible says, examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. The Bible says, if you go out from us, you're not of us. So try to help that person like this one pastor did, and the lady got really mad at him. You've heard me say this illustration before, and then years later came back and thanked him. She said, you were the only person that told me that, that there's no biblical evidence. I mean, read the book of 1 John is the whole book of, the whole list of the evidence of salvation in a person's life. And then, the woman saw that years later, went back and thanked him, as they said, and turned to Christ in genuine repentance and faith and was saved. So, biblical belief in Jesus includes that, that, that or the evidence of that biblical belief in Jesus is that, that desire to follow him. I mean, I've talked to more than one person and it'll be like, It's just very troubling because you got the verse, none of those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. The doing, and I don't mean doing it perfectly, okay, but just overall, the overall trajectory of their life is they're seeking to follow the Lord, and when, and when, and when confronted with sin, there's a brokenness, a contriteness, and there's a repentance. There's, I mean, I mean... You know people. I'm not criticizing. It's like we, we know people that even in the most basic stuff of life may be professing to follow Christ, but in the most basic <coughs> means of following him in obedience are not. Okay. Commitment. Because believing, here's the thing, the word believing is an ongoing condition of the heart and not just a one-time past action, okay? In John 20, verses 30 through 31, explain this to us. John 20. Why was the Gospel of John written? Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, ongoing believing, with evidence of that belief, that by believing, you may have life in his name. Or, as John said in his uh, first epistle, in 1 John chapter 5, I love this book and I love these verses. The one who believes, ongoing belief in all three parts, intellectually, personally for salvation for that one's own sin, and then a commitment and, and, and evidence that they're following, ongoing belief. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony himself. <laughs> and the one who doesn't have ongoing belief doesn't have the testimony in themselves, and they're, and they're giving evidence of that. The one who does not believe has made God, made him a liar because he's now believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So, for God so loved the world, that's the magnitude of his love. I mean, yeah, that's the magnitude of his love, the manner of his love, and then the bullets. And I said it to Dan, I, I put magnitude twice. And I actually put them all incorrect. <laughs> oh, boy. The magnitude, the second one is the manner, Christ being offered for the sins of his people. And the last part is the magnificence. It says magnitude, magnitude in the air, but 
Doesn't, doesn't matter. Magnificence is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. That word perish, it would be better almost for the person that's perishing if it meant cease to exist. Just, okay, they perish, that's it, they're all done, and they just, there's nothing else for them after that. But perish there refers to a final destiny in room, in hell, apart from Christ. The word perish is used to describe life without Christ. I mean, even on the worst of people, right? We're all depraved, we all need a Savior, but there's sunshine, there's light. There's uh, manifestations of God's grace and common grace and mercy being extended to people uh, on a daily basis. As opposed to life without Christ in hell. That's perishing. Perishing means what John 3.36 says. Perishing means being under the wrath of God. Perishing is in John 3.36. He who believes ongoing belief with those three <coughs> parts intellectually. Yes, he died for my sins and there's a, this ongoing evidence of that. Not ongoing perfection, just ongoing evidence, overall trajectory of that person's life and when there's no blatant sin and it's pointed out and revealed, they're like, I'll never forget that time when somebody I, I was like sharing that and I just pointed out this you know, particular sin and you know, like wow I didn't even really know that was a sin. I didn't know living I didn't know that was a sin. And I'm like, okay, so what, what will you do? And they said, um, better repent and go in a different direction. That's what the Bible teaches, right? He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son, will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. So perishing means being under the wrath of God. Perishing is not going out of existence, it's staying in existence and suffering in the fiery torments of hell. Eternal I mean, think about the torment of hell. By the <coughs> weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, for me, when I think about that, the worst part just must be alone just alone, right, in utter darkness, alone, no hope of parole, no hope of, you know, getting out. And maybe to add to the torment, there's a like some of, maybe there is a Bible, you know, I can't point to a verse off the top of my head, but maybe there's a, oh my Gosh, I sat at that church service in the Church of New Life on December 24, 2023, you know, and heard the, how eternal life was being offered through Jesus Christ and the gift of eternal life. Or I've had a family member, or if I had a loved one, I had someone sharing the gospel to me repeatedly, and I, you know, just rejected it. Just rejected Christ. That would add to the torment. You ever know how you beat yourself up now in life when you make a mistake? It's like, oh man, I can't believe I did that. Why did I do that? And part of that is you're suffering the consequences of your earthly decision that you make. You imagine thinking about that, thinking about the consequence of that throughout all of eternity. Second Thessalonians chapter two, I mean Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses eight through eleven describe what this perishing is. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, there's an element of obeying the God. That's the third part of that commitment. There's an element of obeying. Not obeying in order to be saved, but obeying out of grateful appreciation. Just an overwhelming sense of God saving me. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 
And when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all those who have, what's the word I'm going to say? Believed. Who have believed. Among those who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. Right? Someone shared it with you. And it was believed. So have you received the gift of eternal life? What's your response to the gift of Christmas? I've shared this before. I remember, you know, in our family's celebration of Christmas in our unsaved home back there as a young person. A lot of festivities, a lot of hoopla, a lot of we went to this house, we went to that house, a lot of stuff. It was Christmas Eve, go over one family members, receive presents have a meal. Next day, go over another. This was always all of our extended family. So one, 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 it would be like, go over my mother's house, go over my aunt's house. Next day usually was when they were alive, go over grandpa and grandma's house. They, they'd be at the Christmas, they'd be there Christmas Eve too. Go over grandma and grandpa's house and then have another big meal and get more presents. And then at one point we would squeeze in Cheryl's family when, you know, that, when that all happened and we were engaged and then married. Then we'd squeeze in, go into their family's house, and um, never squeezed out. The, the 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 celebration of his birth from a biblical perspective, even even as an unsaved person, we didn't squeeze that out. How much more now? How much more now? Wow. What's your response to the gift of Christmas? Sweet some verses circling around the birth of Christ. Matthew chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. This is a response that people have to the gift of Christmas in genuine false worship of Christ. You all were there at one point. Where is he who has been born King of the Jews in Matthew 2, verse 2? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. This is Herod. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And he was like, they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for that is that has what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time of the star. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the child. And when you found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Which was obviously not what his intention was. His intention was to kill Jesus. And that's why he made the order to kill all the newborn male children in Bethlehem. So there's that, ah, pretense, pretense, false, ingenuine worship of Christ. Unsaved or regenerate person will worship, or probably worshiping in some places Christ like that right now. And that's not like, you know, being mean, that's, that's just like compassion, it's like pity, and it's like you'll have meals with some of them this tonight, or tomorrow. Share with them what Christ means to you, and what he's done for you. So there's in genuine false worship, there's indifference. You see that in the Luke account. Indifference. To Christ, his birth, his presence. There was the census. Um, Brother John read this. And verse 7 says that she gave birth to her firstborn son and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. 
and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you. This is, this is God with us. This is Christ's birth. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You will find, the sign will be, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So you got the shepherds, you got the angels' announcement, and it's like, other than um, the shepherds and later the magi, all of Rome missed out on this, right? There's indifference to Christ. There's indifference to worship of Christ. What's your response? What's my response? Have we received the gift of eternal life? Look at the shepherds there, verses 18 through 20 of Luke 2. And all who heard it wondered at the things which, the, which were told to them by the shepherds. Who were all, who were the all that wondered? Nobody else went there to go find, go see this. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. It's a good response to Christ's presence, pondering, treasuring. <coughs> Look, you know, we have the world, the flesh, and the devil that we deal with, right? And, and, and a lot of times in our choices, in our actions, in our decisions of life, sadly, because we are not yet perfected and are being perfected, there's moments in our life where we reveal what we treasure most. There's times when it's Christ. There's times when it's it's either Christ or itself. Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. In her heart, you got those verses in Matthew about finding that pearl of great price and finding this treasure and uh, hunting it down and looking for it. And there's intensity there. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard just as had been told them. So there was praise. There was worship. There was telling others. That's a response to the gift of Christmas. There was telling others. I remember telling others way more often when the Lord had just saved me. I remember sharing that with family members and loved ones way more often, sadly, than maybe I do right now. Right? Sharing it. Grab them out of the world celebration of Christmas. Drag them. They're dragging you and I all the time. They're dragging us all the time to, you know, the world celebration of Christmas. They're dragging us a lot of ways, a lot of the time, away from worship even on this time, on today. Grab them and say, you know, come on. Let's go. I want, I want you to come with me. I'm hearing the gospel. I'm hearing the message of Christ. I'm hearing the message of salvation. Do you understand they're perishing? Do you understand that they're under the wrath and judgment of God? Maybe they'll hear something that, you know, if not today, soon thereafter will change the course and trajectory of their life and they will come to be saved by Christ. I mean, you know, you, I have somebody witness to me more than once. So there's the worship and there's the adoration of Christ. What's your response to the gift of Christmas? You know, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, one of my favorite verses, one of my early memory verses, and this is eternal life. What is eternal life? To know thee, to know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So there's that element of knowing Christ, ongoing belief, knowing him, a relationship with him, a hunger and a thirst for him that is only satisfied by him and is never actually fully satisfied. It's crazy. The more that you're trying to satisfy that spiritual and hunger and thirst, 
the more you're being made hungry, and there's a continual going after the Lord with that spiritual hunger and with that spiritual thirst that only He can satisfy. You know, what's that illustration? You know, too often we're like, you know, digging mud pies in the slums. God offers us a holiday at sea. That's that C.S. Lewis quote. And you're drinking in, we're drinking in the world's slop and the flesh and the satisfying of the flesh. I mean, pressing on to know Christ is not a passive deal. Okay? At all. And don't you love what Paul said in Philippians 3.10? Saved man. I counted all that other stuff. I counted all that religious tradition stuff that I knew as dumb, as garbage, uh, and trying to have my own sense of self-righteousness. I counted all that stuff as garbage, and then Christ saved me, and I was given the righteousness of Christ, and He literally knocked me off my horse and had to open my eyes that I could see who he was and all that other stuff I count it now as dumb. And what do I want to do now, he says? I want to know Christ. That's an evidence of biblical belief in Jesus Christ is wanting to know him more. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. That's Romans 8. Knowing Christ and the power of His resurrection, that His life is changing me, that, 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 that He's helped me to put to death the deeds of the flesh. There's a verse in there that I so desperately need. Let me find it. Because you know what? We, we all desperately need this one. It's in Romans 8. Let me find it really quick. I hope I put my finger right on it. This is what knowing Christ looks like. This, um, let me go back to 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading you to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so we may also be glorified with Him. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory to be revealed. But that, all of that, but that part 16, praying, Lord, I pray, we pray, that your spirit will bear witness and testify with my spirit that I'm a child of God in my reaction, in my interaction, in how I respond to life, children, work, bosses, all of it. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will bear witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. It is a good prayer. It's a pressing on to know him. I, I quoted Philippians 3.10. I, I want to read the verses that follow because this is what the response to the gift of Christmas could be for all of us. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then for you when you fail, and then for you when you stumble, and for though, then when you find yourself doing the very thing that you hate again and again and again, like in Romans 7, Paul says, not that I've already obtained it, this is pressing on, beloved, not that I've already attained it, or have already become perfect, but I don't lay on the ground and I don't wallow in self pity and I don't beat myself up when I sin. I confess, I repent, I go to Christ, right? And I said that. That was meant to be an encouragement. I might have said that like a condemnation and I apologize for that. It meant to be a um, encouragement. Instead of doing that, press on. That I may lay hold of that for which also Christ laid hold of me. And he says again, brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. This is, you know, the great apostle Paul. I haven't laid hold of it yet. I do the very things I hate, he says. But one thing I do, you've got to have short-term memory here, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, 
Forget what lies behind years ago. Forget what lied behind just the last five minutes ago when there's sin and disobedience to the Lord. Forgetting what lies behind. Forward, forward, forward. Always pressing forward. But reaching and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on. You've received the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. You've seen the magnitude, you've seen the magnitude, the manner, the magnificence. There's a, you're pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So God provides the gift of eternal life for those who believe in Him. We've seen the magnitude of it. For God so loved the world. The manner of it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The manner. The magnificence. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The magnificence that whosoever believes in Him will have eternal life. So, God is with us, is the message of the birth of Jesus. The challenge for us, always, is to live, Lord, help us to live all of life in the reality and the power and the presence of the eternal life that we have received. I'm going to read two more verses, and then a quote for the week, and that will be it. John, chapter 1. Have you received the gift of eternal life? Do you have intellectual assent? Yeah, check, check, check. I believe all that. That's good. Do you believe he's the only way to salvation? Do you believe he's the only means by which you may be saved? I, I you might be able to say yes to that. But has there been a, 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 a confession and a repentance and a change in your life immediate change in your life and then an ongoing changing in your life that gives evidence that you have been born from above. Has that happened? Or will you walk away, you know, that was nice, indifferent, walk away like the rich young ruler, not having attained eternal life. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, but as many as received him, that's the beauty of Christmas, to them he, the, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Have you received Christ as your Savior and Lord, and have, do you have biblical belief in Jesus Christ? Have you confessed? Have you repented? Have you turned to Him? Will you turn to Him today? Will you speak to me or John today? If you're not saved, will someone watching turn to Christ today to be saved? Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10 says it this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. So no one may boast. Oh, where do the works come? The works come in the third part of the biblical belief in Jesus. The works come in the demonstration of the following of Jesus Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Paul's epistles talk about walking in Christ and following him, right? Quote for the week. Martin Luther said, speaking about John 3.16, I think we, I'm sure we've seen this quote before, said, these words, John 3.16, flow like milk and honey, which are able to make the sad happy, the dead alive, if only the heart believes them firmly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the manner, the magnitude, the magnificence of your love. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to uh, respond to the magnitude, to the manner, and to the magnificence of your love in a strong way, in a stronger way. Help us to press on. Help us to go forward. Help us to continually go after. Help us to share the message Help us, Lord, to repent of any indifference to Christ. perfect example is repent. You've forsaken your first love. 
Help us, Lord, to repent of any ingenuine worship of Christ. Lord, help us. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. Christ, may Christ just affect us in a greater and stronger way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.